We Were Liars, written by E. Lockhart, read by Brittany George. Chapter 85. I sleep for what might be days. I can't get up. I open my eyes, it's light out. I open my eyes, it's dark. Finally, I stand in the bathroom mirror. My hair is no longer black. It has faded to a rusty brown with blonde roots. My skin is freckled and my lips are sunburnt. I'm not sure who that girl in the mirror is. Bosch, Grindle, and Poppy follow me out of the house, panting and wagging their tails. In the new Claremont kitchen, the aunties are making sandwiches for a picnic lunch. Jenny is cleaning out the refrigerator. Ed is putting bottles of lemonade and ginger ale into a cooler. Ed. Hello, Ed. He waves at me, opens a bottle of ginger ale, and gives it to Carrie, rummages in the freezer for another bag of ice. Bonnie is reading and Liberty is slicing tomatoes. Two cakes, one marked chocolate and the other one vanilla. Rest in bakery boxes on the counter. I tell the twins happy birthday. Bonnie looks up from her collective apparitions book. Are you feeling better? She asks me. I am. You don't look much better. Shut up. Bonnie is a winch and there is nothing to do about it, says Liberty. But we are going tubing tomorrow morning if you want to come. Okay, I say. You can't drive. We're driving. Yeah. Mummy gives me a hug, one of her long, concerned hugs, but I don't speak to her about anything. Not yet. Not for a while, maybe. Anyway, she knows I remember. She knew when she came to my door. I could tell. I let her give me a scone, and she saved for breakfast, and get myself some orange juice from the fridge. I find a sharpie and write on my hands. Left. Be a little. Right. Kinder. Outside, Taft and Will are goofing off around the Japanese garden. They are looking for unusual stones. I look with them and tell the, they tell me to search for glittery ones and also ones that they could be arrowheads. When Taft gives me a purple one he's found, because he remembers I like purple rocks, I put it in my pocket. Chapter 86 Grandad and I go to Edgerton that afternoon. Bess insists on driving us, but she goes off by herself while we go shopping. I find pretty fabric shoulder bags for the twins and Grandad insists on buying me a book of fairy tales at the Edgerton bookshop. I see Ed's back, I say as we wait at the register. Mm Mm-hmm. You don't like him. Not that much. But he's here. Yes. With Carrie. Yes, he is. Grandad wrinkles his brow. Now stop bothering me. Let's go to the fudge shop, he says. And so we do. It's a good outing. He only calls me Mirren once. The birthday is celebrated at supper time with cake and presents. Taft gets hopped up on sugar and scrapes his knee falling off a big rock in the garden. I take him to the bathroom to find a band-aid. Marin used to always do my band-aids, he tells me. I mean, when I was little. I squeeze his arm. Do you want me to do your band-aids now? Shut up, he says. I'm ten already. The next day, I go to cuddle down and look under the kitchen sink. There are sponges there and spray cleaner that smells like lemons, paper towels, a jug of bleach. I sweep away the crushed glass and tangled ribbons. I fill bags with empty bottles. I vacuum crushed potato chips, scrub the sticky floor of the kitchen, wash the quilts. I wipe grime from the windows and put the board games in the closet and clean the garbage from the bedrooms. I leave the furniture as Mirren liked it. On impulse, I take a pad of sketch paper and a ballpoint from Taft's room and begin to draw. They are barely more than stick figures, but you can tell they are my liars. Gat, with his dramatic nose, sits cross-legged reading a book. Mirren wears a bikini and dances. Johnny sports a snorkeling mask and holds a crab in one hand. When it is done, I stick the picture on the fridge next to the old crayon drawings of Dad, Gran, and the Goldens. Chapter 87 Once upon a time, there was a king who had three beautiful daughters. These daughters grew to be women, and the women had children, beautiful children, so many, many children. Only something bad happened. Something stupid, criminal, terrible, something avoidable, something that never should have happened, and yet something that could eventually be forgiven. The children died in a fire, all except one. Only one was left, and she... No, that's not right. The children died in a fire, all except three girls and two boys. There were three girls and two boys left. Cadence, Liberty, Bonnie, Taft, and Will. 
and the three princesses, the mothers, they crumbled in rage and despair. They drank and shopped, starved and scrubbed and obsessed. They clung to one another in grief, forgave each other and wept. The fathers raged too, though they were far away. And the king, he descended into a delicate madness from which his old self only sometimes emerged. The children, they were crazy and sad. They were racked with guilt for being alive, racked with pain in their heads and fear of ghosts, racked with nightmares and strange compulsions, punishments for being alive when the others were dead. The princesses, the fathers, the king, and the children, they crumbled like eggshells, powdery and beautiful, for they were always beautiful, it seemed. As if, as if the tragedy marked the end of the family. And perhaps it did, but perhaps it did not. They made a beautiful family, still, and they knew it. In fact, the mark of tragedy became, with time, a mark of glamour, a mark of mystery, a source of fascination for those who viewed the family from afar. The eldest children died in a fire. They say, the villagers of Burlington, the neighbors of Cambridge, the private school parents of Lower Manhattan, and the senior citizens of Boston. The island caught fire, they say. Remember some summers ago? The three beautiful daughters became more beautiful still in the eyes of the beholders, and this fact was not lost upon them, nor upon their father, even in his decline. Yet the remaining children, Cadence, Liberty, Bonnie, Taft, and Will, they know that tragedy is not glamorous. They know it doesn't play out in life as it does on stage or between the pages of a book. It is neither a punishment meted out nor a lesson conferred. Its horrors are not attributable to one single person. Tragedy is ugly and tangled, stupid and confusing. That is what the children know, and they know that the stories about their family are both true and untrue. They are endless variations, and people will continue to tell them. My full name is Cadence Sinclair Eastman. I live in Burlington, Vermont, with mummy and three dogs. I'm nearly 18. I own a well-used library card, an envelope full of dried beech roses, a book of fairy tales, and a handful of lovely purple rocks. Not much else. I am the perpetrator of a foolish, decluded crime that became a tragedy. Yes, it is true I fell in love with somebody that, and that he died along with the other two people I love best in the world. That has been the main thing to know about me, the only thing about me for a very long time, although I did not know it myself. But there must be more to know. There will be more. My name is... Cadence Sinclair Eastman. I suffer migraines. I do not suffer fools. I like a twist of meaning. I endure. Thanks for reading with me today. If you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe.